So welcome in to this very special event. I want to introduce the panelists and then hand it over to the moderator for this Black alumni panel. It is truly a great group. Uh, Lawrence Woods, a member of the UNH football and wrestling teams, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania native, who graduated in 1972. He went 40 and five as a wrestler. So the Miz has nothing on him. First <laughs> UNH wrestler to win the New England Wrestling Championship as a freshman. He was the first black wrestler to win the New England crown. As a junior, first black UNH wrestler to win the New England Qualifying Tournament, a member of the UNH Alumni Diversity Hall of Fame, Black Pioneer, uh, now lives in Morristown, New Jersey. Our next panelist, a member of the class of 1999, his donation back to the university led to the construction of the Strength and Conditioning Center at the Fieldhouse that bears his name. His number 23 is retired by the UNH football team. He is a UNH Athletics Hall of Famer, Jerry Azuma, who set the all-time record for rushing in Division I AA as a running back at UNH, won the Walter Payton Award as the top player in college football in 1998. And then he was drafted and played as a defensive player in the NFL for the Chicago Bears, also as a pro bowler on special teams, still in Chicago, has done some media work for the Bears. Now our next panelist, class of 2007, Whitney Edwards, basketball standout for the Wildcats, four-year member, known for her defensive ability, America East All-Defensive Team 2006-2007, the 2007 Defensive Player of the Year, captained the Wildcats twice, came back to the alma mater as a coach in 2015, and now is the head coach of St. Rose in Albany, New York. And our fourth panelist from the class of 2017 is Demi Musis from Orangevale, California, a standout performer for the volleyball team. She won four straight America East championships from 2013 to 16, one of only two players in UNH history to win four consecutive America East championships, back-to-back -back player of the year in her junior and senior seasons. And now works at UNH as the GM of Wildcat Sports Properties. I'm representing here tonight. And last, but certainly not least, he is the moderator for this event. Also a UNH alum, class of 2010, a five-year member of the Wildcat football team, Jordan Long. He came back to UNH as the Assistant Athletic Director for Academic Support Services, helping out with our student athletes through mentoring, counseling, and proactive monitoring. And he will take it from here. Jordan, take over, my friend. Uh, well, thank you, Murph. Very much appreciated. And thank you for that, that great introduction. And thank you to everybody who signed on here today. It's very much appreciated for you to take out some time to actually hop on and listen to this discussion that we're about to have, because I think it's going to be a very powerful and very progressive discussion we can have today. And thank you to the panelists as well, too. Your time and energy that you're donating to us and volunteering. I can't say it enough. It's greatly appreciated for you to come back and, and give your time and energy to this event right now. I know a lot of people are excited, so I'm not going to speak about that anymore. We'll just hop right into it. Uh, if you can, just tell me a little bit about yourself, Whit. We'll start with you. Um, and what made you come to UNH? Uh, one, thanks, Jordan, for putting this together as well and, and bringing us all back, you know, to have this conversation and, and be able to talk a little about UNH. And hello to everyone who is here and on the call tonight. I know some very familiar people are definitely in the room, which is cool to see. And, and as far for me, um, UNH just happened to be the place where the, the opportunity, you know, was presented. One of my former assistant coaches is, is on this call as well. So I just, I know at the age of 15, um, my second year in high school, second summer of playing, you know, travel ball, I told my mom, like, I, I, I wanna go get a scholarship. I want to play. I want to go to school for free. I want to make sure that you don't have to worry about it on the back end. So, you know, for me, it was just a, a place where I, I had a little bit of connection with the staff. Um, I did have some connection again with, with teammates as well going into the process, but it just seemed like a great opportunity outside of my comfort zone, outside of, you know, what I was used to, to be able to go away to school. And the biggest thing was the, the financial piece being a full scholarship and an opportunity for me to ha have a different situation for myself than what I was coming from. Thank you, thank you. Demi, we're gonna swing it over to you. What brought you to UNH? Yeah, similar to Wit. Um, so I'm born and raised in Orangeville, California. Um, and when, when I committed, I was, gosh, I guess 17 at the time. And I remember when the coaches came up to me, I was like, New Hampshire, where the heck is that? <laughs> like, what? No way. 
Um, but I came out and visited, and to be honest, the campus is beautiful. There's nothing really like it. Um, and, and I was just blown away by the atmosphere of it. And I kind of thought, you know, my 17 year old self here, I was in California. I was like, when in the world am I going to pick up my entire life and move across to the East Coast, if not now? And especially like Whit said, um, the opportunity of having a scholarship. So um, I decided to make the move. Um, and, you know, I thought if I hated it, I can always go back. But here I am <laughs> in Kensington, New Hampshire, living and breathing and working at UNH. So. Um, it ended up working out for me, but yeah, that's really, that's really what brought me there. All right, thank you, Demi. Jerry, gonna bring it over to you. What brought you to UNH? Uh, football. <laughs> 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 so um, my parents are from Ghana, West Africa, and uh, I was born in Oklahoma. And that's where the love of football actually started for me. Um, I remember vividly my father rolling me a soccer ball at like six, seven years old. And I picked it up and started running and hitting people. And they said, you know what? We got to switch this ball up. So that was a love of football. And that was, that's how it, it first started. Then we moved over to uh, Worcester, Massachusetts and uh, continued on playing football. And I uh, had a lot of love for it. Played throughout um, high school and we were very successful as well, but I didn't end up starting until my senior year. Um, and we continued to go on. We were very successful and um, two major schools basically offered me scholarships that I was very interested in. UNH was one of them and uh, Northeastern was another one. Um, you know, I, I, it was a real tough decision at first, but once I started to like, you know, peel back a couple of layers of UNH, I started to, um, and then I went to and visited the campus. I instantly fell in love with it, um, fell in love with the program. Uh, the coaches were phenomenal that were there. Coach Mack, um, Coach Bose, uh, Chip Kelly. So. I felt like I had a good supporting cast there uh, for football. So just like everyone else, the financial piece was very important, but um, um, that that's main, mainly the main reason why I came to UNH. Thank you, Jerry, thank you. And Lawrence, what brought you to UNH? Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And from seventh grade on, the schools I went to uh, were predominantly white. Uh, they were academically tracked or non-academically tracked, meaning whether you were going to college or not. And I was always in a classroom where I was only the usually the only black student in my class. And so when UNH came down, uh, Lou Tepper came down. He was assistant coach at the time. He came down and talked to me and another student. Uh, and I said I was interested uh, because one of my main goals was to get far away from home so I could be on my own and figure out who I was. And UNH uh, seemed to be far enough away, you know, 12 or 13, 14 hours driving. Uh, he insisted I come up and visit. Uh, and so I came up to visit and there were really three things that happened. Uh, when I came up, I stayed the weekend and I stayed at, I believe it was Kappa Sigma. And the brothers of Kappa Sigma were really nice to me and really accepting and really wanted me to come up there. Enough so they told me that they would, if I came, then I wanted to join the fraternity, that they would uh, cross the color line. I'd be the first black nationally in the fraternity. Uh, so I was honored by that, you know, I chose not to do it later. Uh, second, uh, the recruit, the person I was walking with, asked me if I had seen a hockey game, and I went and saw a hockey game uh, for the first time. And that was exciting because the hockey teams were always good. And while I was there, the recruiter was shrewd enough to have a couple of females come over and act like they knew who I was. It was a really big deal. And so that kind of swayed me too. And that was the old, uh, look me up when you come up here and stuff. And so that helped. And the third thing was, uh, there was another black student who came up at the time, who was a student athlete. And his name was Greg Scott. And he was from outside of Pittsburgh. And he was visiting and trying to decide himself. And so we talked while he was up here at UNH and he said, well, you know what? Let me know if you decide to go to UNH that I'll come up there too and we can be roommates. And so those three things, the uh, beauty of the campus, you know, the size of it all and the distance away from home, you know, all swayed me. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. And we're gonna bring it back to you. Uh, and 
surrounding that, what made you come back to UNH? You know, upon arriving here, once the, the bells and whistles are all done on your recruiting visit, now you really got to get to work and be on campus. What were your initial thoughts when you were on campus when you got here? Lawrence, we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, well, as Jerry can attest, when you first come on campus, then you come up as a student athlete, but you're really an athlete student. Because for football players, during those first two weeks, then only football players are up there. And we're doing three days. So we're doing you know practice in the morning, practice in the afternoon, and then you're having film sessions and things at night. And so for two weeks, you're really focused on football. Uh, and then when the classes started, then our coach was clear, it was Coach Root at the time, he was clear to tell us, don't schedule any classes to interfere with your football. And so <laughs> that was a uh, clear terms of priorities. Uh, and I heeded that. And my first impression when students actually came was that the campus was very white in terms of snow and in terms of people, you know, but that wasn't an environment that I was uncomfortable with because Pittsburgh was very cold in the wintertime, you know, and the environment I had been in was very similar. And I think that when they came down recruiting me, then they were very aware that uh, I was going to school in an environment that would be very similar to UNH, and I would probably do fairly well. Thank you, thank you. Jerry, we're gonna bring it to you. What was your initial thoughts being on campus after your recruiting visit? What was your comfort level and, and why was that? So when I first got to UNH, um, you know, uh, similar to Lawrence, it was all about football. And it was all about um, training camp, getting ready to go for the, the start of the season. You know, I didn't have the luxury of having three days like Lawrence did, thank God. Um, <laughs> because I probably would have gave my scholarship back. But um, <laughs> right away, I, I already had a sense of family because uh, the, the football team was essentially my family. Those are the people that I hung out with the most. Those are the people that, that uh, I felt comfortable around. And those are the guys that you know I played football with and I was gonna continue on my journey with them. So in terms of that, I felt extremely comfortable. Um, I was eager and anticipating um, the whole school life of just kind of being free and being away from the family, be away from Worcester, you know, and just experiencing some freedom. But um, I had that supporting cast with um, the football team. So um, for me, it was, it was initially all about football. And then when school started, obviously I had to hit the books because, you know, without hitting the books, then obviously you couldn't play. So um, when I got on campus, I noticed that, you know what, there aren't a lot of people that look like me. <laughs> and um, it didn't really shock me as much because I went to a, a, a high school where um, it was predominantly white. And uh, I just kind of knew how to navigate and just kind of be, be myself in that environment. And I felt like it would just initially carry over to UNH, which it did. But um, in terms of like the sense of community, I had that community with uh, the football team. Thank you, Jerry, thank you. Demi, we'll go with you. What were your initial thoughts when coming on the campus and what was your comfort level? Yeah, I think when you think about going to New Hampshire, especially being from California, I was expecting it to be white. Um, and so it was funny for preseason, um, we also arrive early and we're, we're here before any of the other student body is. Um, and the football team is one of our more diverse populations within the athletic department. And so, um, you know, I was honestly kind of shocked. Like I was like, oh, okay, like we got some color here, like we're good. I was like, I was a little shocked by it um, because I was expecting it to be more white. Um, and so, you know, coming in, I, I was very comfortable. Um, but then, you know, when you start to go to class and it sinks in and the rest of the student body comes in, you're like, oh, okay. Like the athletes are the ones that are the black people here and everyone else is, you know, they, it's a very white community. Um, I think, I look back at my four years and I, I didn't have a single black professor. Um, I didn't have, you know, in the athletic department, I think Brandon was the only academic advisor that I worked with that was a person of color. So other than really like the football team bringing some diversity in, 
that was, that was really it. Um, and so I think once classes started, that's when I was like a little bit more shocked. Like I was like, okay. Um, but when I first came in, I was like, oh, this is great. Um, because it was just us and the football team. So it seemed, it seemed normal. Thank you. Thank you, Demi. I know what that, that mid or that, uh, that preseason can be like when you're just around nothing but the guys on campus. And I mean, that was kind of my feeling as well, too, when I first got here, being around nothing but the football team, but things switched up very quickly once classes start. We're going to have you finish this one off. What was your comfort level like whenever you got on the campus and what were your initial thoughts? I mean, yeah, I would definitely echo uh, what the other panelists have said. I mean, I, my two years prior to coming to UNH as well, I had actually transferred to uh, a predominantly white high school, Catholic school in uh, Stanford, Connecticut. So from the social aspect, I felt like that part of it for me was, was okay. Um, it didn't feel like as much of a, a shock to the system as far as just being able to maneuver and interact with people uh, because of that experience, I think. Um, having it, you know, be at a predominantly white high school. Previous to the predominant white high school, I went to high school in my hometown of Mount Vernon, New York, which is, I mean, if you can just think of complete opposite, it, it was just that, you know, predominantly people of color in that high school, the way things are taught, the curriculum, um, you know, I was in an environment at that time where I just, I really didn't take things academically, especially very seriously. Um, so when I fast forward to my freshman year stepping on campus, I had those two just drastically different experiences as a high school student. So I, I knew that I could at the very minimum, you know, hold my own maybe with, with those who didn't look like me, but it was definitely, you know, to relate to what others have said, it was a bit of a surprise. Um, I also had the experience of coming to the connect program, which is for, you know, students of color It's a pre freshman program. That, that UNH had. And I attended that with two other of my, my incoming freshman teammates who were also black. So my, you know, my introduction to it was, I was also you know, amongst more people of color before the start of the school year. And once classes and everything started, the social part I think again was, was good, probably sometimes too good. Um, <laughs> but the, the other academic piece of, just am I really prepared to be a student? You know, those were the things that I think I, I struggled probably the most with were how to access resources and how to actually utilize the, the things that were being given to me um, because I just hadn't really had that experience before. So I, I would agree, you know, definitely very shocking on the back end. Um, but, but I think there was a little bit of an effort to, I guess, help buffer it before we got to that point um, of, of school opening up. Thank you, Wit. Wit, I'm gonna come back to you because I think this is a this is where it really gets into it as far as your experiences here being on campus. And I know people speak a lot about being in the, the field house itself and having that be somewhat of a safe zone. Um, but did you ever face any type of adversity while you were on campus based on the color of your skin? And how did you handle those type of events when you, when you were faced with them? Uh, I mean, as I mentioned too, the, the, the biggest adversity I would say was, you know, first semester, freshman year, really trying to buckle down with academics. You know, I, I was not prepared for what the, the rigors of academics were going to be just from my previous experience. So I think just coming in a little bit behind as far as what that was really going to take, that created adversity in and of itself. Um, and just not really having the maturity to understand people are here to help, people are here to, you know, guide you. I just, I wasn't picking that part up. Um, I think as far as, you know, interactions and, and things socially, absolutely. Um, I don't think in my personal experience, you know, if I'm talking about things that happened directly to me, I very seldom had anything overt occur, you know, in a form of uh, injustice or, or something on part of the color of my skin. Um, I definitely bear witness to certain instances uh, of racism or probably saw things, you know, there were times when, you know, profanity has been written on public property or, or that kind of thing has occurred. But again, in my case, I think I probably experienced more covert uh, examples 
So, you know, I think of things like the N word being utilized. Um, if we're at a party and, or we're at any kind of social gathering where there's other people, people of color, people not of color, and there's songs playing, you know, I can remember just being very on edge about what happens when that line gets played from the song and you kind of looking around worried about how the energy in the room is going to shift or change. I remember being very vigilant about that um, in social settings and having other teammates who were really vigilant about that. And it's tricky, you know, because at that age too, you're trying to fit in with people. So sometimes things that you might want to speak up on, you don't necessarily do it in order to not rock the boat. Um, but then there's other times where, you know, you have the people who you're close to, you know, like I mentioned, I had teammates of color. My family was a great resource for me as well. Um, but you more so go to them just to vent, you know, you don't ever think it's corrective necessarily because it is bigger than you. So it, it's a, it's a mixture. Um, and again, I think it's really tricky to pinpoint them because for some of it, you have to normalize it in order to continue to stay on track with what you're trying to do. Um, you can't call everything out and you, you can't have such a, a hypervigilance on things that again, it takes you out of what you're there to really do, which is to play your sport and to get your degree. And that's what, you know, my journey was about. It was about going through four years and making sure that I was gonna be able to walk across the stage when it was all said and done. Um, but, you know, I think again, as a, a black woman on that campus, I had a different level of vigilance than even a, a black male would have had to had mm -hmm. because they have their own experience too. But more for me personally was what I saw and witnessed in, from, in, in terms of overt things happening. And in my own walk, it was just, again, trying to pick and choose, you know, when was the right time to fit in and when was the right time to, to, to call people out or to try to make a point about something. But that was usually something very in-house. That was something very amongst me and those I felt like I could trust or that I was closest to. And more than anything, it was to vent but it was never really to solve anything. So like I said earlier, you know, I think it was really internalized for a lot of it. Um, and some of it even probably missed if I'm being totally honest, um, because you, you're so focused on just trying to make it, you know, for lack of a better term. Thank you, Wade, thank you. That's a very powerful answer. Thank you for the honesty on that. Lawrence, we'll, we'll swing it to you. Did you ever face any adversity while you were on campus based on the color of your skin? And how did you handle that? Uh, very little. My my uh, experience was very similar to Whitney's. Uh, I came up when I was an athlete, you know, all year round, and so I developed friends, you know, white and black, in the athletic community in particular, and I think a lot of them had my back. Uh, I also went around to the fraternities uh, during that first year into their pledge parties, where they would have parties where if you were interested in joining, you could go. And so I went to as many as possible so I could meet everybody uh, and then be able to go to their parties without joining. And so I felt like I had a pretty good network of friends, you know, but, you know, like Whitney said, you get their comments being made and you're walking down the street with a white male or a white female and you get people driving by in the car and they slow down and stare at you. And, but I didn't hear the N word uh, and I didn't feel, you know, a, a lot of negativity like that. Because again, I was keeping it focused and keeping it moving. Uh, I did have a situation before I graduated where I was taking a course with a history professor and I was working as a police officer at, at the time. And so my time was really tight and I wrote the paper, but I was supposed to go to see him and talk to him about the paper before I finished it. And I didn't do that. And so once I finished it, I gave it, a, turned it in, and I thought I had done a really good job. And he called me in and asked me who wrote my paper for me. <coughs> and he basically inferred that I wasn't capable of writing a paper at that level. And so he knew somebody had written it for me. Uh, and I told him nobody had uh, written it for me. I said the only person who even looked at it was another graduate student who had looked at it and she had said that she thought it was good. She had made a couple of grammatical corrections and that was it. Uh, he then told me, well, the paper wasn't that good anyway. So I gave you a D on it. 
uh, and that prevented me from getting my credits. Uh, and then I saw him, or he saw me later in town and campus, maybe a month or so later. And I was getting newspapers like I normally did. I usually get the New York Times and the USA Today and another paper. Uh, and so I picked those up and was looking at them and then went to the register. And he walked past me and said, Mr. Woods, I'm so glad you read. <laughs> and I, you know, I knew he was casting shade, but I just kind of smiled, said, have a nice day and let him move. Because my attitude was that if you weren't, if I didn't allow you to block me, then you can't block me. You know, and so I just dismissed that and moved on. But it was minor stuff like that, you know, that happened to me. Well, thank you for that story and, and thank you for sharing your experience on that one. I know it took a lot of strength for you not to say something else back to him <laughs> after a situation like that, but thank you for sharing that. Demi, we'll, we'll take it over to you. Did you face any adversity while you were here on campus and how did you handle that? I find it interesting because I'm the youngest, obviously, on the panel, and it, I would expect to hear more, like, worse things coming from the other panelists than I experienced, but I feel like um, as of late, and I don't know what the pendulum of, you know, racism, I don't know why it's this way, but I feel like it, it was, you know, I graduated in 2017, and there was a lot of racism on campus, and you heard the N-word a lot. Um, you know, I, I was a student athlete, uh, you know, a, a good one at that. And, and um, I remember, you know, we, in, in our, in the field house, which is supposed to be our safe place, um, the UNH volleyball locker room um, has like a wall of pictures throughout the year. And I was the only person of color on the team. And um, I remember someone went and cut out every single photo on that wall of my face every single one was cut out mm. and I remember it said um it said one isn't like the other one of these isn't like the other or something along those lines mm. um and, I, and at the time I was like I was just shocked I think more than anything and all my teammates were in the locker room already kind of waiting for me to come in because they just saw it and I was like flabbergasted that that would happen um yeah and so for me, I think it happens, it happened more often. And I heard a lot more from other black students that were um, during my, my time period as well. Um, and, and, you know, microaggressions happened all the time. I think, I think the biggest one that stuck with me for, you know, coaches and players on the call is, is re with recruiting. Um, you know, it was kind of a joke on the team that I would never host a recruit for reasons I won't mention, but I was just, they were like, Demi does not host recruits. Like, nope, we're not partner with her. I was the wild California girl. Um, and, and then I get to my junior year and, and again, I'm the only person of color up on the team at the time. And I remember the coaches saying like, Demi, you're going to host a recruit this weekend. And everyone literally started to like laugh because they thought it was a joke. Like they're like, what? Demi's not hosting this recruit. And I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm a big girl now, junior year. I get to host this recruit. Like, hell yeah. Um, and I remember the coaches saying, you know, like, yeah, I think you guys are going to have a lot in common. You know, she's from out west, blah, 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 blah. So we start practice. And um, the recruit walks through the door and she's black. And I remember feeling in that moment, I'm like, so the only thing that I had to offer for this recruit was the fact that I was black and she was black and you wanted her to feel comfortable being with another black person. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the only thing that I had that made me feel like that was the only thing I had to offer. And it was, you know, it's a, it, it was a crappy situation, but I think with UNH, you know, I'm also, a, I'm not a believer of trying to paint a false image of what UNH is um especially when it comes to diversity um just because i think it sets black athletes up for disappointment if you don't know right if someone calls you and they're like hey i'm gonna give you a ferrari and you show up and it's a honda civic you're like what, what the heck i thought i was getting a ferrari right um so i just think it sets black athletes up for disappointment if you if you aren't honest with where we're at but i also want to make the point that it's also not my job or our black student athletes job to be the black 
token kid that is showing that there's diversity on campus. And I think that's important. Um, you know, I think it's the coaches and the white athletes job to be allies to the black kid, you know, to that token black kid. And they should be the ones giving the tour being like, hey, I'm gonna give this campus tour and here's the Black Students Union, here's the Beauregard Center. Hey, they host an awesome Martin Luther King Jr. Summit that I went to and I think you would love it. Our, actually, a couple of our teammates are doing it next year and we're so excited for it. Um, I think that's how you create more inclusivity on campus when it comes to DEI. Um, and it's not just, you know, the black kid showing the black recruit all the black things and then they show up and they're like, oh, there's not that many black things here. <laughs> um, so my experience was, you know, overall, I had a great experience um, at UNH and I loved playing volleyball, but I would be amiss to say that there wasn't hate crimes on campus and there wasn't microaggressions and, you know, it happens in our own walls and at some times I don't think it's purposeful. Like, I don't think there's malicious intent behind the recruiting story, right? Like, I don't think my coaches were purposefully trying to hurt me at all, but I think sometimes it's just a subconscious mindset um, that can make us feel small at times. And I think it's just um, important to, to make sure that you're thinking of that and we're thinking of that all together. Mm. Thank you, Demi. I, I know that story, you told me that about that before and even hearing it again, it still gets me upset just to hear something like that happen to you. But also thank you for providing some solutions and, and different ideas on how to correct those issues as well. So thank you very much on that. Jerry, we'll finish off with you as far as uh, any adversity that you may have faced while on campus and how did you approach that situation? Um, in terms of like uh, being a black athlete, I've never felt any type of adversity. I never felt like there was an issue. Um, at my time at UNH. Um, I obviously, a majority of the, of the football players are, are black and a majority of the people, you know, that are on that campus are, are you know, African-American. So I was cool with, with all the guys. And, um, you know, I was a very social person as well. So I became cool with pretty much a lot of people my freshman year and it happened right away. So um, wherever I walked, um, in whatever environment that I was in, I always felt comfortable. I always felt safe. I never felt any type of negativity, but I did hear like little whispers here and there of, um, you know, uh, of, of some racial tension uh, with guys that were on the football team. And as our football community of black guys, like we would come together and we would talk about these things. And I noticed that there wasn't a lot, there wasn't a lot of it. And I don't know if I was thinking that there might be a lot because I, I came from an environment where when I went to St. Peter Marion, I was one of, out of a thousand people, I was one of, you know, five black kids that went to that school. And I never felt that racial tension, but I always felt like people were looking at me kind of weird and crazy and didn't have like high expectations for me and things like that. So in the back of my head, in the back of my mind, I, I felt like, you know, they, people were kind of looking at me differently, but in terms of like, you know, presenting that right to my face. I never felt that tension or that, that, uh, that divide. So uh, my, my time at UNH was, was an excellent one. Um, I'm glad that none of that stuff happened to me. Um, but there are, there were situations that came up where we would talk to, I would talk to my, you know, black friends and they did come across some of that racial tension. And uh, collectively we would talk about it and try to figure out ways to, you know, try to get over that hump. And we did that. Um, but like I said before, we had that community of black guys um, on the football team, and that was my, that was my safety net. So if I had any adversity or any trouble or anything that I needed to bounce ideas off of, it was it was those guys. Those guys were my safety net. But fortunately, I, I never ran into any type of situation based off the color of my skin. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. <clears throat> I know one thing that everybody seemed to have in common was the fact of having some type of community, some type of community, some type of support to help them get through any issues they may have found. Jerry, I'll bring it back to you. And you just briefly talked about your support system within the locker room itself. Uh, did you have any other support system outside of the locker room or was it just the community within the locker room itself? 
So like I said uh, before, my whole goal was to make as many friends as possible, be social, uh, be active, but I also knew that I had, you know, um, a time crunch because, you know, juggling academics and juggling sports at the same time was, could be a difficult thing, but I had that safety net um, and the football team was my safety net. And then I had like an extension outside of that of friends that I met that were people of color as well. And I, there's, there's still friends of mine today and we still talk every single day um, to this day. So um, outside of football, I did have that community, um, but I never went to that community in terms of like, if, if I needed to bounce things off of my, off my chest and, and have a, a sounding board. Uh, I always went back to, you know, my guys that are on the, on the team. Um, those are the guys that I was just closest with. Those are the guys that, you know, that I had the most community and sense of value with. So in terms of like that, that outside extension of, of, you know, friends that I made, they were there, but I never really went to them uh, and never set, uh, got some of their attention. It was, it was mostly just within that football circle. Thank you. Uh, Demi, we're going to bring it to you. Did you have a support system uh, outside the locker room at all? Um, Kathy Copley was like my bread and butter for the athletic department. She um, was really great at listening and just being able to connect you to the right resources that you needed at the time. Um, and so if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have been involved with OMSA and the Black Students Union um, and doing, you know, some diversity training down at Northeastern. Um, so I, I think there's people in the athletic department, and part of the reasons why I wanted to be a part of this panel for the Black student athletes is, you know, my door is always open and I, I want to be a resource for you, for you guys, um, Black and white. And so um, I know she, she made a huge impact on me and my, my career here. And, and without her, I wouldn't have had the resources that um, I needed just because I was a part of a predominantly white sport. So I didn't have a lot of the same um, candor that, you know, Jerry or Lawrence um, might have had with their with their black students, uh, with their black teammates. So um, yeah, Kathy was able to put me in touch with uh, people down campus that um, yeah, were, were awesome. Thank you. you. You brought up a key figure and uh, Kathy Coakley because she was huge in, in my development as well, too. That was a lost gem for sure. But Kathy Coakley was a, a great personality, a great woman who definitely helped out a lot of student athletes through a lot of things. So thank you again to Kathy Coakley and thank you, Demi, for, for sharing. We, we'll bring it to you. Who is your support system while here at UNH? Uh, I mean, definitely, I mean, inside the locker room. My teammates are the people who I spent the most time around. So I, I would definitely say I leaned on them. And I was fortunate to have a few teammates of color through my time here. And I mean, similar to Jerry, you know, I still speak with these people fairly often or we're still very much in contact as well. My family was also a really, really key resource for me. Um, you know, they made a point to make it to games. They made a point to drive up to Durham uh, Durham is like four hours from my hometown, so it was definitely an undertaking for them to be getting in the car and to making those trips. But I, I was always really appreciative that they were around and they were actually there to, to lean on. I could call them for anything. Um, even if I had no more money on my card, you know, Wildcat Pizza while I was there, I had to use mom's debit card a few times on that. But Definitely my family was a, a really big, big piece of that, you know, and to Demi's point, like I, I wish that I took more of an opportunity to be connected outside of the, the field house. Um, you know, as I coach now, that's all I'm encouraging my, my players to do is to, you know, be more than your sport. You know, there's something to be said. Yes, you can train, you can be about it. If you have a certain trajectory to be a pro, there's a certain level of intensity that and focus that you do need. You know, but for everyone else who's going to have life after sport, it's so important that you do find other resources outside of your sport um, and you have other things that you can turn to, you know, that that is the most important um, because the sport isn't always going to be there for you in the way that it is now. And, and so much of who you are is tied into it. So to, to really be able to find those other clubs or activities, um, it, it is really important. And, you know, I know Demi has shared before how 
you know, she went to the BSU as well and had that resource. And that was something that I wish I did put more time into. I think it would have, it would have just given me a more well-rounded experience. And I think I would have felt a little bit more developed on the other side um, and just had a different meaningful or different meaning to the experience. So, you know, for me, it was mostly team. It was mostly in-house as far as the, the people who I was spending my, the most time with. And it was definitely my family uh, who I was leaning on for the most part. That's real dedication to drive up four hours to really show support like that. That's love, that's love. Lawrence, we'll, we'll finish off with you as far as your support system while you were here and who would you have to reach out to and lean on to while you were here at UNH? Uh, like everyone else, to a large degree, it was other athletes like myself. Uh, but are you still there? Yep. Oh, okay, no, I lost the picture. Uh, my situation was a little bit different in that uh, Martin Luther King had just been assassinated in April of that year of 68. Uh, and then U University of New Hampshire had decided to reach out to some black athletes and students, and but they couldn't get it together soon enough. And so during that first year in September of 68, then five black athletes came up to join the other, no more than five students that were on, on campus who were black. Uh, and so those four, five black athletes, the other four black athletes were my source of support. Uh, Dave Pemberton was a basketball player. And I just talked to him today again. We talk regularly. Uh, Craig Boatman came up the same year as I did. He was a football player. Uh, he and I talked regularly. Uh, Greg Scott was my roommate. He was from Pittsburgh. Uh, Greg, unfortunately, only lasted for about a year and a half. Uh, and he's since passed away. Uh, and Kurt Farmer was another person. He came out of Boston and he lasted for a year. And so the people who continued to be my support system you know, were the athletes. Uh, but in terms of financial support and academic support, then I was really out on my own, pretty much in the wilderness. Uh, I look at the things that are being done now with athletics and the things that you're doing, Jordan, and, you know, I'm slightly envious. You know? uh, we, it was kind of like we were told to get into the water and swim, you know, and if you really get into trouble, let us know. But other than that, you know, you're here to enjoy the water and, you know, do the best you can. And that's how UNH kind of was at the time for us. Uh, the next year in 69, uh, there was a professor at UNH who was at one of the uh, adjunct campuses named Don Land. And he was a six foot six uh, black guy who was lived right off campus. So if you went off of campus uh, down the road, he was down at the bend. And he was the one who was instrumental in recruiting, getting two people who were black administrators to come in and actually do recruiting. And he also, at his house, he invited people down, black and white, to party and relax and just get off of campus, uh, listen to music, get a tremendous music connection, and to have nice food. And so he was a tremendous support system you know, to a lot of us, uh, just enabling us to get off uh, campus and experience something different. Uh, Eric Joyner was a student who was there at UNH for a couple of years, and he was the first leader of the Black Student Union. He and a, another Black student named Sandy Moore sat in in 1969. They sat in at T Hall uh, for half a day, uh, demanding that Black students get their own house, uh, they get more aid. Uh, and other things. And after half a day, the administration you know, chose to do that. And so we ended up with a Yamojo house, uh, which was in between Stoke Hall uh, and Main Street. Uh, and that was a place that we could meet you know, and party and so forth. Uh, black students who wanted to live relatively close together and were living in Stoke Hall uh, and a number of different things. But 
there was a big difference between the five of us who came in in 68 and then the group that came in in 69 who were on Martin Luther King scholarships. Uh, and they had a lot more support academically and financially you know, than I did in my group, the five of us. Uh, but we fought our way through and a lot of ways it probably made us stronger. And, you know, and the bottom line is that three out of the five made it and have advanced degrees and you know, are still doing well. Uh, so in some ways I feel it would have been great if all five would have, but you know, some people are built for it and some people you know, aren't quite as well. And so I was fortunate enough that I was able to make my way through. So, so Lawrence, just so I hear that right, you said you came in with only five people of color? Uh, five counting myself. And there were five no more than five black students on campus at the time. You said so five were, black people on campus? Yes. So that made a total, no more than 10. Uh, I had met a guy named Ace who was, everybody told me, have you met Ace, have you met Ace? When I came up for my recruiting visit, uh, I met Ace and he was in ATO. I uh, was an athlete and nice guy. But then by the time I got up there, he was gone. He had flunked out. Uh, there were only 10 of us on campus. So it was rare to see people. So if I didn't see uh, my fellow black athletes, then I generally didn't see anybody black on campus that first year. You know? But I was so busy uh, that I was fortunate enough to do well in wrestling. So that took me deep into the spring. So I was busy enough that uh, you know, it wasn't a big issue. And the next year, it was like an explosion. In my sophomore year, they brought in 30 black students, predominantly from Newport News and from Chicago. Uh, and that was the big year as far as black students coming there. And the following year after that, uh, it was about 15 and probably 15 after that. And then the program pretty much, you know, ended. And it was a gap between students coming, black students coming. You know, they pretty much trickled and there wasn't really much and much in terms of recruitment after that. So. I'm just thinking back to my time at UNH and I came in 05. And okay. granted, I had the locker room where we had, the team was probably about 50-50 at that time. So you got a roster of 100 guys, uh -huh. 50 black guys automatically. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, like, this is good. We can work with this. And then you look at campus, you're like, wow, this is not very diverse. Wow. I couldn't imagine being on campus and seeing the same nine other black people on campus. And that's all we got. That yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to sit well with me. And I would, I would struggle, honestly, to be be in that type of environment. But thank you for sharing on that. Um, I know you you spoke a lot about uh, coming on campus and being here and fighting through a lot of the adversity. Would you mind just sharing some of the most important lessons you learned while being here on campus and how you're able to use your time wisely while you're here on campus? Lawrence, we'll start with you. Uh, the things I learned while being on campus was that there were you know, the, I, my experience was that almost everybody I dealt with was, you know, treated me well and treated me respectfully. And I know that's partially because I demanded that uh, and partially because I was an athlete, who I guess was decently known. Uh, but my experience in terms of that uh, was pretty good. Uh, and I learned that people will, if you carry yourself a certain way, uh, then people will recognize your abilities and a lot of times reach out to you in order to offer you situations or involve you. In that. Uh, that happened to me as far as, you know, when I eventually became a police officer, uh, you know, my senior year, I ended up capping the wrestling team. Uh, you know, there were just different things and they uh, suggested that I run Sawyer Hall for a couple of years. And then eventually before I left UNH, then I did a master's program in US teacher corps. And all those situations were situations where people reached out to me, you know, and said, there's opportunity here, you know, are you interested? 
And UNH taught me that, you know, I understand some things about myself when I went there, but it was a time of self-discovery. And I tried to use that time to really understand who I was, you know, what my strengths were, what areas I need to work on more. Uh, and I did that, I think, pretty well and use that in order to continue to move forward in my life, you know, and try to do positive things for myself and for others, the same way that people at UNH have done for me. Jerry, we'll go to you with that. Um, what was the most important life lessons you learned while being here on campus and how have you used that to navigate your life after that? Um, for me, I would say it was time management. Um, when I first got to UNH as a freshman, I was just kind of all over the place. And um, I didn't really utilize or know how to utilize my time correctly. Um, I had a lot of things I had to juggle, obviously, with academics and with sports. And you know, with sports, it's like having a full-time job. So you're, you're at the facility and you have to be dedicated you know, on, for practice and things like that. But at the same time, you have to make sure that you're on top of, you know, your academics as well, and your books and your major. So um, when I first got uh, here to UNH, it was, it was, it was difficult at first. Um, I was just kind of out there and I just didn't really utilize and know how to manage my time wisely. Um, it wasn't until like my sophomore year where I figured, okay, I can't do what I did last year as a, as a freshman. I got to come in, figure out how to manage my time appropriately so it can work for me and I can actually, you know, do things that I've always wanted to do and see things that I've always wanted to see, you know, at UNH. So for me, it was, like I said, it was, it's about time management. It's about um, uh, focusing on the things that I have to get done. Um, and, you know, there was a time where I was slipping a little bit academically and uh, talking to my support system, which was, you know, the UNH athletes, the football players uh, on and talking to like some of the older guys on how they did it. And, you know, they just kind of guided me down the right path. But for me personally, it was it was about that time management. And we'll swing it over to you. What was the most important life lessons you learned while you're on campus and how that helped you navigate situations post-grad? Um, I would say the most important lesson I learned during my time at UNH would be, I think the power of asking questions and, and being curious. Um, I, I think it's important to not take things at face value. Um, you know, as athletes, the time management part is key, but a lot of times we're also being told our schedules, our classes, when we're eating, what we're eating, you know, when we got to be on the bus, um, et cetera. And so I think just if I were to say anything to student athletes, it's, you know, be curious and have the courage to ask questions um, because I think that's essential to learning. And, you know, I think it's applicable when we talk about diversity, equity, and, equity and inclusion, because especially when you're a person of color, because you can take statements at face value, you know, or you can dig deeper and understand why. And then you have the ability then to either gain a, a different perspective um, or give a different perspective. And I think that's really powerful. Um, so I think, you know, my time at UNH just, I, I asked a lot of questions. Sorry, coaches, you might hate me, but, <laughs> you know, I, I challenged, I challenged the system. I challenged my coaches. I challenged my teammates. I, you know, I, I really did um, ask, you know, I might've been a pain in the butt, but um, I, I did, I, I asked a lot of questions to um, set myself up and just to learn. Um, and I think too, for all the student athletes on the call, you will never ever have a time in your life where you, where you will have so many resources at your fingertips. Um, and I think that's really important is to, you know, like we've been saying, not to echo, but to branch out outside of athletics and meet new people, um, you know, meet your teachers, academic advisors, um, use the counseling center. There's so many resources at your fingertips that you won't have access to on a day-to-day -day in the real world. 
Um, and the more that you can dive into all of it um, and meet people, the better opportunity you will have um, when you leave campus. So that would be my, my answer to that question. All right, thank you, Demi. And Whit, what were some of the most important life lessons you learned while here on campus and how do you use that to navigate? Uh, yeah, I think for me as a student, and again, I've had this kind of dual opportunity to, to go to school at UNH and then have time away from UNH and go back to, to work there. So I would say, I mean, as a student, it was absolutely about like growth and maturity for me. I, I had to do a lot of that very quickly. And I think over the course of my career, I was able to, to, to get there through a lot of help and, and counseling, I would say. Uh, I know Coach Brown is on the call. She was someone I had to meet with very frequently around academics in terms of just trying to stay in the structure um, and making sure that I could get everything done. So can anybody hear that too? Who's, who's, uh, who's, who's uh, Android's going off? All right, I think we got it. Um, and it's no shade to Androids because I also use an Android, just in case anyone was wondering. Um, but in any event, growth and maturity was a really big one. Um, learning how to, to really network and access resources, similar to what Demi was saying, I agree 100%. You, that is a skill. That is something that you need to really learn how to do. And over time, I think as I got a little more comfortable with people, I felt a little more comfortable reaching out to them. And you know, beyond that, it was just, again, who am I? I think Lauren set up a, a point of, you know, it's, it's a time for exploration and really trying to figure out yourself. So I, I went through a lot of that over the course of four years at UNH and it came with a lot of hard battles. I mean, you know, as a freshman, I lost both of my grandmothers, one at the start of my freshman year and one right at the end of uh, my first season. So just again, dealing with, with loss, dealing with trying to figure out who you are and, and trying to find your way in a world around people who are completely unfamiliar. It, it was definitely, I think, a long journey, but I, I took a lot away from it in the form of just getting better year after year and, and feeling like I was, I was growing and developing. Um, I think another piece that was really big was, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, is just far as how underprepared I was. Coming from where I'm from, Mount Vernon, New York, people will argue as far as what, what the school system looked like at that time and what it looks like now, but just not really having the resources to be a college student. Um, and another part that was a real smack, and for some of people on here who will not have student debt when you finish, um, financial literacy. That was a huge thing for me as well. I, I racked up my first credit card debt, I think like, halfway through sophomore year. And when you start getting calls from creditors and people who, who want you to pay that bill, that's a real life lesson. Um, I did not have the financial literacy to understand. I did not have parents who were financially in a place where they could teach me the things that I learned after I opened a bank account at 18. You know, that was a, a really big piece that I didn't even know was missing. So, you know, when, when you, depending on your starting point, you have access to a number of, of different things. I definitely took for granted understanding how important that would be on the back end. And, you know, when you do have a scholarship and you don't come out of, of college with debt, you, you live in a place that wants you to have debt. Like that's how you get credit. So it, it was just a, a eye-opening experience to go again through those four years. And it was everything from growth and maturity for who, like me developing who I was in my sense of self and, you know, the just true life lessons of what it is to be academically prepared to compete in the classroom as hard as I was, you know, prepared in my sport. You know, I didn't have the same balance off the court as I did on the court. So those were definitely my, my biggest lessons. Thank you, Wynn. You ain't lying about that financial literacy though. I'm getting that credit card, then you're gonna go act a fool at the mall but nobody tells you you gotta pay that back eventually. So <laughs> I think with we interest. all learned that hard lesson. Yes, with interest, with interest. I might tell you about that one. Um, I think you guys brought up um, a common idea here and it, it se seemed to stem around perspective and learning about the world around you and the environments that you're in. 
what did UNH teach you about race and culture? And we'll just come right back to you. And you could just expand upon your answer about race and culture and your views on that after your experience at UNH. Yeah, I mean, I think between my time as a student and my time, you know, working there professionally, um, I just had an experience to understand, like, I'm a, a Black queer identifying woman as well. And as a Black head coach, even, you know, I, coming into this past summer, 2% of basketball coaches or college coaches are Black women. So there's not automatic space carved out for me in my walk of life or in what I do. So it is very much about how comfort, how much comfort do I have in making room for myself or making conversations important or being open to engaging so that people feel like I'm approachable and can have those conversations with me um, because it's not a given. So I think again, going to UNH as a student, when you walk on campus and there are not a lot of people who look like you, it was the same as an employee there. I walk out on campus, there's still not a lot of people who look like me and there's still not really any space that's carved out for me to be able to go into and speak openly or candidly about you know the things that are important to me in my walk of life. Um, again, that, that was an automatic thing and it's been something for the entirety, entirety of my professional career that I've had to seek out. And at this point for me, you know, 2021, that's something that I'm, I'm fully taking on. And I think since my time at UNH as an employee, I've definitely just made more of a concerted effort to take on. I think making that space is extremely important. I think representation is extremely important. And yes, it's increasing. Yes, I know we see posts all the time about new people being hired in positions of power or, or leadership positions who are people of color and who are women of color. So it, it's all important, but my, my time being there in both ways just made me know that it has to happen. You know, it, it's not a question of an if, like it, it needs to be something that's talked about and something that's made a priority if it's going to happen. Um, and for me, I can't shy away. And again, I can relate back to being in college where I definitely would have shied away because it's awkward to be a peer and feel like you're gonna be cast out if you talk about this hard thing. And I'm at a very different point in my life as a professional where now that it just has to happen. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. There's nothing more important. So having those conversations, um, making sure that people know there are people like you who are out there, who are grinding, who are finding a way and who are, you know, making a way for themselves. It, it does exist. And I'm 35 years old now. I still have so much to learn about my background, where I come from, where people, where my people come from. There, there's just a bigger picture. So I, again, I think the time there has sparked all of this and the need for it to continue to happen and to be a conversation. And it has helped me grow to understand what my part in it is. Um, I don't always have to necessarily lead the discussion, but I'm definitely always willing to, to have it if I have to. Um, and again, just to have a presence so that people know we're here, if anything else. Like we are here, we are working. And even if the space isn't made for us, it's gonna be made. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Whit. Thank you. Jerry, we'll swing it over to you. What were your perspectives um, on race and culture after race, race and culture after your time here at UNH? Right. So um, like I said, my time at UNH was was excellent. And um, I never had any situations or any like glaring problems. Um, for me, for the most part, it was just smooth sailing. And I did have that support system, that support cast also so um like i said before in terms of time i had to make sure that i managed my time and i had to make sure that i was just focused and that's the main thing that i that i came away with is i, I knew that i had to focus in and and make sure that i was seeing things clear um in terms of like academics and with sports just excelling in sports i i had to stay focused and with that focus came uh a lot of like training, a lot of film studying, um, a lot of different things to, to keep my, my productivity elevated. So um, 
you know, fortunate for me, I, I was, I went on to, you know, have a successful uh, NFL career. But, um, you know, when I got to the NFL, I noticed that like my focus kind of dipped a little bit. So I had to internalize a lot of, a lot of my, my thoughts and make sure that I got back to where I needed to be because I was, I was frustrated because of just the rigors of being an NFL athlete, number one, and number two, switch of positions, um, uh, not really knowing uh, my surrounding and my environment uh, with moving to a different state. Even though it was a very exciting time, I just was just uncomfortable and my focus kind of dipped. But, you know, um, my father has been very inspirational inspirational in, in my life. And um, I, I would talk to him constantly uh, at my extreme highs and, and my extreme lows. And I remember a couple of lows of, of me feeling like, okay, well, I'm not necessarily doing the things that I want and I'm not really happy, but you know, I'm just kind of going along through the motions. And I've had those strong discussions with my father and he kind of like put me back on track and, and really told me to, to buckle down and focus and, and prepare myself and prepare, get, get ready to understand what's, a, what's ahead of me and making sure that um, I was doing the necessary things to achieve my goal. So for me, um, that time management, like I said, was, was very important, but um, just staying focused and, and realizing that there was a, a goal for me out there. And I've worked so hard and focused so much to get an opportunity to, to achieve that goal that once you, the goal is in front of you and you're, you've, you've kind of achieved it, it takes even more focus to stay on that level because people are trying to chop you down left and right. So for me, um, it was it was definitely the focus uh, piece. Thank you, Jerry. We'll, we'll take it over to Lawrence. Oh. Lawrence muted. Lawrence, can you unmute yourself? Yes. There you go. I don't know why it muted also. Uh, do you want me to talk about just race and culture as an undergraduate? Yes. Or, okay. Uh, you know, coming from a predominantly white environment in Pittsburgh, and then coming to a predominantly white environment at UNH, you know, there really wasn't a whole lot of change. Uh, you have a bonding with your teammates, but there's a sense of isolation also, because after all the celebration, you know, enjoy on the field win or lose, then you tend to go separate ways. And it's not intensely meant to feel that way, but I think, you know, you invariably feel that way, that you're separate and you're isolated. Uh, fortunately, I had, you know, black teammates, you know, that I was close to and that were supportive. You know, but you have a sense of that. Uh, you have a sense that when you're going through campus, you know that there's a lot of attorney and attorneys were where the parties were and there's a certain culture there that you really don't fit into uh but you know you fit into the degree that you choose to or that you want to or you just don't go you know and so race and culture as an undergraduate in the four years was always there you know and when i did stuff in wrestling when i won and i was the first black and that was celebrated to a certain degree, somewhat uh, subtly, but often, you know, pretty loudly. Uh, they sent pictures back to an article back to my uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so it could be posted. You know, I know as a recruiting tool, uh, but it was like I was always the first, and I knew I was representing not just myself, and not just the university, but also other Black athletes. And so there's a certain amount of pressure there and you choose to carry it to the degree you choose to carry it or you choose to feel it to the degree you choose to feel it. Uh, and I just, you know, continue to do what I do and try to be me during you know, that whole time. Uh, my sophomore year, at the end of it, I actually wanted to stop playing football and just wrestle and be more involved with uh, Black students in the organization on campus. Uh, but the people who were in charge of black scholarships and money uh, told me that wasn't gonna happen, that they hadn't brought me in, so I wouldn't be involved. 
And so progressively, as I went through my years at UNH, I started reading more books that were uh, out of the norm, not the norm, but the standard history books and started understanding more about multiculturalism and diversity and, and African American history. Uh, and so by the time I graduated, I had a much better sense of who I was and who I was in context of the university and the nation in total. And that interest and drive carried over to my master's and the things I did there. And then I ended up later working for Penn State uh, as a uh, uh, as a person who brought students in, particularly students who were minorities to Penn State. Uh, and at Old Dominion, I worked with a group on a project where we were trying to look at why there was so much racial diversity or discrimination at Old Dominion. And so my background, my experience as an undergrad at UNH then spurned me to do the things I did later in my life be involved and have that interest, uh, which is carried over to today. I'm still doing things, writing and doing things as far as black history and being involved in that. And that all started at UNH as an undergraduate. Thank you, Lawrence, thank you. And Demi, we'll, we'll finish off with you as far as how, is your, how have your perspectives changed on race and culture after your time here at UNH? Um, I think as an undergraduate, um, you know, my perspective on race and culture was kind of, I'll, I'll talk about the culture piece because I think race is a little bit different, but I think culture at UNH, each team had their own culture, right? And that was kind of what you lived and breathed and, and died by. Um, and so you had, to, you had to fit into that culture, but I think as an athletic department, I don't know where we, we sat fit fit it in fit in <laughs> uh, I don't know where we fit in as a volleyball team to the overall culture of it um but I think it's what's really awesome is being back at UNH um it's it's great to see the progress that is being made and the importance um that the administration and the athletes um is demanding of the athletic department um and so I think you know when I left talking about race and culture and thinking about UNH, I was like, we tried. And now being here um, and, and working and being a part of, you know, the Committee on Mutual Respect, it's awesome to see that it's actually being done and the work is actually being done now. Um, and, you know, it's going to be a long road because, you know, we've been talking about it since I was back in school of, you know, there needed to be change. But this is the first time where I've actually seen and been a part of the athletic department making steps to improve race and culture within the athletic department and on campus. And so, um, you know, my experience now and how I looked at it back then are, are very different. Um, but I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be back at UNH and experience the growth that's being made. Yeah, me, I'm, I'm grateful to hear you say that as well. I know that that committee for mutual respect definitely came um, after some some challenging conversations, and I definitely can remember the work that went into just trying to get that that started. And I'm I'm really glad to hear that it is it's moving forward and it and it's showing some progress um, because I know also I left there in 2017 as well uh, that May, and that was something that was definitely on the table to become more. So that's great to hear. Yeah, 2017, so that's when I left too. Um, and I remember back then, yeah, it was, I remember feeling frustrated um, of wanting change and, and thinking that there was gonna be change, but nothing really happened. And so, but I will say now, thanks to Jordan, thanks to the whole committee, um, it, it's, it's being implemented and it's cool to see. Awesome. Jordan, can you do me a favor? Can you answer that question for me? I have been on race and culture. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, my opinion on race and culture after being here at UNH, it definitely expanded. Um, I think when I first got here, I thought I had a good sense of the people around me and the world around me. And I ran into a couple of different people who basically try to put me in a certain box as far as identity 
And I felt some type of way about that. I felt like, how can you put me in a box when you don't even know me? And I would really start to be, I understood what it was like to have a presence in a room and how to approach certain situations. So I understood, you know, if I'm going to be coming into a room and I'm talking with slang and I'm, my pants are hanging down, of course, people are not going to give you the respect that you feel you deserve. So understanding my presence when I walk into a room and how I talk, but then also understanding that I have my own prejudices and my own, um, my own issues within myself that I project onto other people without even knowing them. So understanding that not every woman is going to have it easy in the world and um, just not every, not every person is going to be what you see on TV and what you see on social media is they're going to be their own person. So you definitely can't generalize people at all. And that's the approach that I take on a day to day basis. I come into contact with so many different people and I have to give them the benefit of the doubt, whoever they may be. And based off of our conversations, our interactions, that's when I know how to approach you and how to address you in certain situations. So understanding the world around me and taking a deep breath and understanding what I'm projecting to people, because it's all about perception. And that's the perception of what you give off is how you're going to be received. So I always take that into heart and try to put my best foot forward whatever I'm doing, because I understand as a, as a black man, a dark skinned black man, you know, a lot of people view me as a threat without even knowing me. But until you have that conversation, that's when you can see the guards start to come down from people and you start to say, oh, he's he's actually a nice guy. Wow, he, he doesn't talk like some rapper I've heard on TV before. He's actually educated. And you have to fight a lot of those prejudices on a daily basis. And, you know, we're just conditioned to do that, especially after my time at UNH, when I, I ran to a bunch of ignorant people. And then after they had that conversation, like, you're, you're different than what I expected. Like, Absolutely right. And you know, I'm about to give you a different vibe every single time because I'm not what you expect. I'm not what you see on TV. Um, and I think that's just, it's a poor, it's a poor showing of what you see in, in a day-to-day -day social life because you shouldn't expect me to be coming off as a rapper or be ready to sell you some weed or something. You should just treat me as an individual as I am. I, I educated me. I got two degrees. I'm, I'm going to act like I'm educated because I am. And I think after I learned that and understanding that I can't approach every single person the, the way I may see them on TV or hear them out, um, you start to get more out of life that way as well, too. You start to understand a lot more and you get a lot more done within a day-to-day -day basis and you enjoy it a lot more because you understand races and cultures from around the world and, and you can take in a lot more rather than discriminate against this certain group or, or thinking this person is going to act this certain way without actually getting a chance to know them. Um, I've had a lot of relationships built off of just having that conversation and putting away my, my own thoughts and ideas and getting to know a person and I've got a lot more out of that one. Um, thank you for asking that one, Jerry. Appreciate that. So what we'll do now is we'll open it up to, to any questions that maybe had. I've seen some that pop up. Um, Brittany, we're gonna start off with you. Are you still in the chat, Brittany? Yes, I'm still here. All right, Brittany, please ask your question. All right, hello everyone. My name is Brittany Cotton. I'm one of the hall directors here for McLaughlin Hall here at UNH. Um, so my question for the panelists is, how did you all manage your intersecting identities as it relates to your own personal growth and challenging the beliefs and values you all grew up with while becoming the person you all wanted to be? Anybody's got that one, whoever wants to answer that. Can't you repeat the question with that? Yeah. Yes, I can, and I go a little slower. Brittany's got a whole pen and pad situation. You, you give us give us that again, please. I got you. <laughs> How did you all manage your intersecting identities as it relates to your own personal growth and challenging the beliefs and values you all grew up with while becoming the person you all wanted to be? Um, I'll jump in first. Um, Wow, that's a great question for one. Um, two, probably as a student, my biggest challenge was around probably my sexuality and, and trying to really figure out who I was in that way. And having 
the girlfriends and the boyfriends and the balancing of everything in college, that really challenged what I knew growing up because, you know, it's uh, straight heterosexual couples. That's normally the pattern and how things get carved out. So it was really one, I wasn't really connected or close to anyone in my family who was really going through that same thing. And for me, it definitely took all four years of my college career to really try to work to figure that out. Um, and for a lot of different reasons. So those are just, I mean, like two pieces of identity that I struggled with were definitely different from what I had grown up around and been taught. And I just, I, I have no idea what steps I really took, but I really just tried to work on becoming more comfortable with who I showed up as. Um, and again, that was a very organic and just a process that over time got more comfortable. And, you know, as you share or as you have that coming out story, it helps to have family members who support you or people who are just close to you who you can actually talk that through with. Um, but I never went to like a counseling center. I never really had that conversation with any adults or administrators. That was just something that I really held to my chest and dealt with on my own and with my teammates and just through experiences. So that's what I would say, just kind of going through it at sometimes grinning and bearing it and then just trying to get the courage to really stand in who I was. I'll jump in there too. Um, for me, I grew up with um, divorced parents, um, white mom, black dad, um, from two very different communities, two very different cultures, grew up very differently. Um, and so for me, I was kind of stuck in the middle being half black, half white. And so I feel like I've struggled my entire life of where do I fit into that mix? Because when I'm around my white friends, I'm the black girl with the extensions and the kinky hair and the tan skin. And when I'm around the black friends, they're like, girl, you whitewashed. Like, and so I think I've always struggled of kind of being that middleman and feeling like I had to pick a side. Like, who am I gonna be? Am I gonna be black Demi or am I gonna be white Demi? And I think that's the catch 22 of society is they make you feel like you have to pick a lane and you don't. Um, and, and I think this is something that I struggled with up until really becoming like a working professional. You know, I, I struggled with it throughout college. And then, and then finally I was just kind of like had an epiphany of like, you don't need to fit yourself into a mold. You don't gotta like just be who you are and and that and that's it. Um, yeah. I I think for me it was um, when people first see an African American on campus, they immediately think, okay, well, what sport are you playing? And um, for me, it was trying to break down that that um, that that stereotype of okay, well, yeah, I, I'm here that and I play a sport and, I, and I'm a football player, but at the same time, like I am a human being, I am a person. And um, I wanted people to understand that like there was just much more to me than, you know, X's and O's because the first thing people would talk about is football. And I understood that that was the, the common ground. And I knew that that's what I did while I was at UNH. And we, we had that sense of, okay, well, we can talk about football, but I had to push that, that uh, conversation a little bit more to, you know, there's more than just football <laughs> and there's more than just X's and O's that we can talk about. So for me, it was all about um, switching that, uh, that uh, conversation from, you know, athlete or football player to just being human and just, uh, you know, having people understand that like where I come from, my background, um, what, I, what, what type of things that I like to, like to do, things that I enjoy doing, and so on and so forth. So I was just trying to do everything I could to not necessarily talk about football and get into, you know, conversations that we can just, you know, kind of talk about on, on, you know, just a human level. Thank you everybody. And thank you, Brittany, for a great question. I knew he was gonna come with some heat over there. So I appreciate that. Liam, I know you asked a question. Yeah, how's it going? All right. So um, I'm uh, Liam Bennett and I'm on the UNH men's soccer team. Um, I actually had a specific question for, for Jerry. Um, 
So obviously we're trying to figure out what our purpose is um, in life kind of through college. Um, and this is just kind of with football and everything that you went through. So my question is from the step from the college football level to the NFL, was your purpose in life to pursue the NFL? Or was there ever a time where you felt lost in college or didn't know what you were going to do after college if the NFL didn't work? Right. Um, I didn't really start um, thinking about the NFL until like my senior year. So junior year, there was a buzz that was going on and there was a lot of different recruiters that started to come through UNH. And, um, you know, I started talking to, you know, certain people as well. Um, agents were starting to swirl around me a little bit. Like life got a little interesting, you know, my junior year heading into my senior year. Um, so I was really focused um, on becoming a professional athlete because I knew that since all, there was this buzz going around that it was a possibility. So um, I do have goals and things like that, but I kind of put that on the back burner and I put all my attention towards, you know, reaching my, uh, my ultimate goal, which is playing in the NFL, just because of that buzz that was going on. So after my senior year, um, there was even more buzz going on with the NFL combine. Um, a lot of uh, scouts came up and they worked me out as well. So life started to change um, drastically and extremely fast. So I, I wasn't really thinking about, you know, all right, I'm going to graduate and I'm going to get a degree and then I'm going to go into the workforce. I was thinking about the opportunity that's presented to me right now um, is, is one where the iron is hot and I got to strike right now. So I put all my attention and all my focus on becoming the best athlete that I could be. And, um, if I didn't do that, then I, it probably wouldn't have propelled me into the NFL. But uh, for me, because there was such a buzz that was going around my senior year, I was able to just kind of buckle down and focus strictly on that and give that the, the best shot that I could. Because, um, you know, after that shot is done, like it's pretty much over with. And then you, you have to figure things out afterwards. But it was an opportunity that was presented to me right away. And uh, I just took full advantage of it. And I, I made sure that I was uh, extremely prepared for it. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Lee. Thank you, Liam. And one last question, it is for the entire panel. Advice on how to seek out mentors in black faculty or alumni. Can you shed a little light on that? Well, I think. Oh yeah, go ahead, Lawrence, go ahead. No, you go first, please. Thank you, sir. Um, how to seek out. Um, again, I think you dep depends on what you want to do. I think it's, it's good to be mentored. Maybe that starts with just making a list of, of potentially, maybe it's five people who you may want to be mentored by and you may not know them. But if there are five people who you think you may know or people you've seen that you are somehow attached to or you're attached to their message, start with just a list um, because those people may not be where you are. I think one of the things in the last year of life is that we're very connected to people virtually. We have more access as a result of the, the virtual space. So again, if, if it's a field or it's a major or if it's an area of, of work that you're trying to go into, people are accessible in a variety of ways, you know, but it might just take some, some research on your part to go onto a website and, and try to find someone in the hierarchy who, who might be in a position that you're interested in. Um, if you are on the campus, again, you have access to, I think everyone's email address um, as far as professors um, or, or administrators or TAs or whomever, you have access to those email addresses. So it starts with you in, in some regard, take the initiative. Um, but I think identifying people who you might have a connection with and really thinking about it on the front end will help bring a little bit of organization and structure to that process. But you know, don't be afraid to reach out and to just try to connect with people. I mean, I think again, that's where it starts. Mentors do not fall into your lap. Sometimes you do have to pursue it. You have to put yourself out there. You have to express your passion to other people and you, you have to extend yourself. That, I think that's a, a great way just as a starting point to get organized around finding mentorship. 
And I would add that uh, the first step to me is that you really have to understand who you are and what your strengths are and what areas you need to improve on. And so really trying to do a self-assessment about what do you really like? You know, what do you really want to do? You know, what are you good at? Uh, and then that will help you make a choice as far as a mentor. Uh, and then exploring you know, the possibilities. Uh, you really need to be able to understand a range of what the possibilities are for you in order to start reaching out. And so talking to people who are maybe doing something that you find interesting you know, or in a field that you find interesting, even if you don't want to go into it, will help you understand what the range of possibilities are. But once you start to understand who you are and what the range of possibilities are, it makes it much easier to match up a choice. And sometimes people will find you, you know, but generally you have to reach out to other people. Hey, Jordan. Yes, coach. You know, um, I think with the mentorship, it, it's pretty important that I think the teams, um, our, our programs here, ought to start making a pretty good list that these student athletes black or white can have an opportunity to talk to them about, and we're doing a good job with it, but I think we can improve it by getting these lists together so that these young, young men and women can have an opportunity to talk to someone who's going through the same experience that they went through, you know, and, and be able to live that, 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 that thing here. I've been sitting here now for over an hour and a half and I was just thinking about something. Uh, I've been here for 46 years as a, a student, a player, assistant coach and now the head coach. And um, listening to all the people in the panel, their, their, their journeys are so different. You know, um, I look at Lawrence and, and, I, and I know the journey he went on because when I got here in 1974, there were six students of color that were playing on the football program, playing in the football program. And when I got to my senior year, those six guys that came in was there was only three guys left. Wow. Um, I look at what happened in the 80s with the recruiting in, in, in football and basketball. And then I look into the 90s and the 2000s to see the numbers that have changed. You know, um, their experiences have changed. I think what we're doing with this committee and what we're doing for the, the student athletes and is to, to, to hear these experiences are tremendous. But I think we have to keep reaching to them to make change and to understand the, the, the struggles that the people before them went through to get where they are right now. You know, Demi struggle in the locker room, Whitney struggle with, with some things. You know, I, I know what Lawrence struggled because I saw it from there. You know, I saw your group, you know, not struggle as much, but again, the community that our football program has from within is something I'm one, extremely proud of. And two, I know how, how, how much it is a, 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 a vital part of our, of our, of our, of our program, you know, so, I think what you did tonight is tremendous. I think we got to build on this just as everything else that we're doing in this university, especially in the athletic department to keep rolling along on this. But it's an unbelievable story going from Lawrence to, to, to Whitney to, to, to Zoom, you know, and I mean, between the guys that they've shared experiences with and still are friends with, I think those guys could be great mentors or those women could be great mentors for the people that are on this phone call that are our athletes or on a Zoom that are our athletes. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. I think um, I can definitely say this about you, Coach Mack, and the fact that you definitely helped build that culture as far as making it all inclusive and having guys be on board and be on the same page. I think that that locker room definitely helped build a lot of great young men and just appreciate you creating that environment for us. Uh, we have one last question. It's from Nikki, Nikki Harnett. Nikki, you want to ask that question? Yeah, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, one of the things that I've heard from my peers is that they struggle with not having um, people of color in the field house in administrative positions. Like they have Jordan, but there's not much like others. So I guess my question would be like, how would it have changed your experience if you guys would have had um, a resource in the field house that you'd that could actually understand your experiences and how important it 
is it for UNH to have more resources like that? Uh, I think it would have been hugely resort important for me. Uh, when you're 18, 17, 18, 19, you're starting out, it's hard to find your way, you know, and you're trying to do a number of things at the same time. And so to have someone who has some experience and a different perspective who I could talk to, you know, and vent with sometimes, but just could help me help say sometimes that, well, I think you're doing that right. Or other times you might want to try something different. That would have been hugely important. You know, being doing it the way I did made me really stronger, you know, but, you know, I would have really appreciated having someone there to do the mentoring. And I think it would have made a huge difference. I'll, I'll echo that too. I think, I think it expands campus wide. You know, I think our athletic department is a direct vision of our UNH community. Um, and so I think, you know, you don't see a lot of black uh, or people of color, I should say, what in, in roles of being a professor of, you know, higher up in, in the president's cabinet. Um, we have made some hires lately, which is great, but I think our landscapes are very similar. And, and I always think we gotta, we gotta start at the top. And I think until UNH can make an impact and, and get some, some new talent um, in here with some color talent, um, I think we'll see more people coming in the athletic department as well. Um, because I think it's not just an athletic department issue, it's across UNH campus. I also think, um, you know, just a different perspective. Um, Whenever I talk about my my support system, I talk about, you know, the football team. I talk about guys that are on the team and guys that I've been around, you know, um, with football. But I never really ventured outside of that and got a different perspective from people that were just, you know, that didn't have anything to do with athletics, that just wanted to go to school and, and learn. You know, I never really got their perspective or, or got their point of view either. So um, just piggyback on, on everybody and what they're saying. It's just, for me, especially it's, I was basically had that supporting cast of just UNH football guys and no one outside of that. So if I saw more people outside of that, then I can venture out and try to get their perspective as well. And I, I would love to answer too. And thanks for that question, Nikki. Um, answer one to shout out Nadine, Petty, who is on the call too. Um, I have not met her yet, but just the presence and knowing that that position has been hired there, to me, being an alum is huge. Um, and, it's, and it's history. So that's awesome in and of itself. Um, and to the point of just representation, again, that's what it is. Even if that's not a person, it's, it's like, what else could we do to help supplement? You know, I remember coming to Durham again from Mount Vernon, New York, like, where do I get my hair braided? Like, where do I go get food that I'm used to eating? Mm. And, and, you know, Boston was like the closest place at the time, but to even just have that information readily available um, for a student or even for an employee, like that would have made a huge difference. I know when I moved back out there to work there, like I just knew places because I have familiarity with the area. But for someone who does not have that exposure and comes to their, comes to UNH for the first time in their lives, no matter what age you are, like that's the information that you're looking for. So, you know, yes, a person who you kind of can look and mirror is, is definitely huge. But also if that's not there yet, or hasn't you know happened? Then what other things are there to supplement it? That that's also a step to take. So that that's you know some of the things that I think about with with regard to UNH is you know not shying away from it one, but two, just recognizing if if we don't have this available, what can we do to help have a build a bridge to get there? Thank you. Thank you. This will be the last question. Ray, are you on here? Yeah. All right. I'll let you go at it. Um, so I guess we like, I just kind of want to know, like, as a person not of color, um, I have a teammate on 
um, on my team who is of color and what's like the best way we can be an ally to them? Or I guess in your experiences, what were the things that you felt the most supported by people who aren't of color? I, I would say my experience was that when I had teammates uh, who weren't of color, and I'm still in touch with a couple of them today, uh, that when they talked to me, not as a black person, but just as another person that they cared about and they knew something about, they wanted to know who I was beyond just being an athlete. And so that's how we bonded. We bonded by talking about you know, things that we cared about, you know, places that we ate or places we like to go, you know, or like to go to the ocean. But, you know, the athletic, you know, we had that bond already. And so being able to reach out and talk about other things and be together in other ways, then that made all the difference to me. I'll go back to um, the MLK Summit that was put on by OMSA at the time when I was a student athlete. Um, I remember all of, again, I was a predominantly white sport, but I would say six or seven of my teammates um, decided to go and do that um, with me. And they learned a lot and, and they went and educated themselves and put themselves out, outside of their comfort zone um, and, and I think those little things that you can do around campus of, of engaging in the community in different ways um, can go a long way for, for your teammates of color. And that's for, sorry too, that's also for, um, you know, the LBGTQ plus community. I know that um, we had a teammate that was um, identified as in that community and you know she did the vagina monologues and our entire team was sitting front row at the vagina monologue cheering her on loving it whether we were uncomfortable comfortable you know like it was an array of different things but um i think it's important just to show support of where people are at because i think if you um do learn what the passions of your teammates are um you'll you'll find that there's a lot of events across campus that they are a part of that you might not be um, and if you can support them in those passions, um, like the vagina, vagina monologues, just because that's top of mind, but um, I think that goes a long way. That's a great question too, Ray. And I think even ask them that question. Um, ask your teammate that question, you know, very directly. And I know that's hard to do sometimes. It can just be, it's, it makes you nervous, but you know, how can I support you? It, just start there, you know, and they may not have all the answers, but at the very minimum to feel like someone's actually tapping into that and has it as a priority, even that small step goes a long way. Like it doesn't have to be anything monumentous. Just again, asking them that question would be a great start. And thank you for putting that out in, in this venue as well. Okay. Well, thank you for the question, Ray. Much appreciated. <clears throat> At this point, we're going to wrap up the discussion itself. Um, first, I just want to thank a couple of different people here to make this thing whole thing happen off. Um, first, I got to thank Rich. Rich wanted Rebby. Hope, hopefully, I got your last name right, Rich. Um, Ashley Tennant, Caitlin Tomasello, Mike Murphy, the man behind the dials there, Jim Robel. You guys definitely help with the production of this and putting things together. Um, this doesn't happen as far as tonight being uh, what it is. And I'm very grateful for the help on all of this project. Um, lastly, I have to, not even lastly, but definitely got to give a huge shout out to the Student Athlete Commerce Committee. I can't express to you how proud I am of that group by far. I'm, I'm so happy to be a part of that group and to advise them to some extent, because they take the ball and really run with it. There's a couple of people on the committee tonight who do an excellent job week in and week out coming up with ideas and actually putting those ideas um, into actual work and doing it. And 
they give me inspiration, a number of other people within the, the building inspiration to do a lot of the things that we do. And this doesn't happen tonight without them inspiring me and motivating me to take that extra step in and use my voice appropriately to make sure that you guys are heard and we spread the message about the Black student athlete experience. So definitely a huge shout out to them and also to the student athletes that I've worked with over the past couple of years who give me inspiration to do something like this. I know we've heard this for a long time now as far as what have the experience has been like before us and, and what can we do to really improve and progress and make things better than how we found it. And without those people in my life and without those people I work with on a daily basis, this doesn't happen tonight. So I just wanna say thank you from the bottom of my heart to everybody who's played a part in this. Um, at this point now, we're going to end the conversation, at least the recording, but you guys can stick around and have more conversation amongst yourselves. I definitely encourage it because we've covered a number of different topics and there's not enough time to actually go over everything, but I definitely wanna continue the conversation afterwards. So thank you again to everybody who tuned in, asked questions and were attentive. Um, I really appreciate you guys being around and, and volunteering your time and wanting to be a part of something like this. So thank you again and have a great night.